Okay, so I really liked all the animatics that you guys showed. I honestly think there's some good work being done here, okay? Now, if you have not yet finished your animatic, you need to, you need to do that, like, immediately, okay? As fast as humanly possible, because if we continue to look at the production schedule that's in front of us, we don't have a lot of time, right? We're in a compressed schedule. If we really start to dig in and look at the details of, our, um, of this class and how much time we have left, shoot, let's just do this real fast, because I think this is a really in, invaluable way to visualize the milestones that are in front of us, okay? So here we are on November 4th, okay? Best case scenario. And some of you guys were able to do this, others were not, and that's okay. All right. Um, you know, some of you guys were able to make your, oops, make your animatics today, which is what I was hoping for. I'll just put anim, there we go, for animatics. There, we'll just spell it out. Animatics. Now, some of you guys were, were able to make your animatics, and that was kind of the intent behind this, right? Because from these animatics, we now have a blueprint of what we're physically going to create uh, you know, for our final project, right? We have a nice visualization of how many shots we're going to have, the contents of each shot. Specifically, we can start making an asset list of things that we're going to need to model and texture. And conceptually, in our brain, I want you guys to start thinking about what the lighting and the rendering of all this is going to be. Don't spend time on that yet, because that comes later. But just start thinking about it. Where are my lights going to be? What time of day is my animation going to be at, right? Do I need to change the time of day to, to facilitate the narrative of my, of my short film? All interesting, good questions to ask now and to begin thinking about, right? For some of you, we have not yet completed our animatics, and here's why we need to be in a hustle to get these done. As we mentioned at the beginning of class today, obviously Veterans Day, the campus is closed. So that's a gigantic X, right? So we can't work. We're not going to have class next week, right? So in order to make sure that we get this done by the 15th, which I'm just going to kind of put down here, okay? So the 15th is when this entire thing is due, right? It's due on the 15th. In order to get that due date, yeah, fun arrow, right? Um, you know, we need to have a good solid block of our rough animation done by next week. When I say rough animation, what am I really talking about here? Not the final product, but kind of without the curve editor and all that. Yeah, stuff. everything being stepped. Focus on the primary keyframes, the storytelling poses that your characters need to adopt to facilitate the narrative of your film, right? That's the focus of the rough animation pass. In addition, since we're not really worrying about the in-betweens and using that stepped curve that we looked at in other places, okay? We can really zero in on the timing of our animations and get a good, solid feeling for how long each one of these storytelling poses need to be held to tell our story, okay? That's really what we should be spending some time on over the next week, okay? Because ultimately, what we need to do, if, and remember, we're going towards the 15th here. So let's reverse engineer the 15th. Maybe that's a better way to begin this. If, if your expectation is to turn this thing in, complete, final, finished, bow on it, and get all done, right? By the 15th. When do you need to have all of your renders done? Yeah, or at least a couple days before, a week before definitely gives you a lot of wiggle room. I like that. I think it's a good idea to put a little pad in there. So if the week before would be the 9th. So by the 9th, we need to have everything rendered. Which will give us a couple days, like if we're if we're rendered by the by the ninth, that'll give us, you know, kind of all of this week in here. All of this jazz to do the editing, right? To throw it into Premiere Pro, comp all of it down, splice it together, and then you know get something that we can produce by whoop the 15th. Okay? So being complete and polished for submission on the 15th. So we need to have everything rendered by the ninth, which means what? What do we have to have after we come back from Thanksgiving? What should be our goal? Because how long is it going to take to render this? Maybe a week. Maybe a week. It's going to take a while to render these frames, right? This is a 30 second animation. How many individual frames are you going to be rendering? At least. 
at least 720. And that's if you render everything perfect the first time. And I think your experience will probably tell you that you're not going to render it perfectly the first time. Okay? You're going to be rendering a bunch of frames here. So we need to make sure that we're giving ourselves an appropriate amount of time to get the render done. Okay? Yeah, go ahead. Can you come back from Thanksgiving with final animation to be done? You got it. You got it. We need to have final animation done. By the time we return from Thanksgiving, you should plan on coming into class on the second, the last official class uh, of this course, with your animation pretty much buttoned up. Okay? Obviously, there's going to be some texturing, some materialing that we'll have to do, some lighting and rendering, but you're going to have a good seven, ten days to get that done. Okay? Are you freaking out yet? Yes, passively. you should be passively. No, I would say actively start freaking out, just not now. Wait till class is over, and then I'm expecting to hear a lot of you know uncontrollable screams outside of the building, and that's fine. Okay, I'm good with that. I'll be with you. I'll be out there screaming because there's I know I know firsthand there's a lot of work that we have to do in here. Okay, we have to be committed to this, and we have to start chipping away at it. Or if you didn't get an animatic done today, you are already behind schedule. Okay. And I know that's a weird idea to wrap your brain around, considering that this is the beginning of November and this thing isn't due until six weeks from now, right? But if you start looking at the physical milestones, okay, we don't have any time to do this. We've got to get it done immediately, as fast as humanly possible, okay? All right. Questions, comments? Everyone concerned? Yeah. Yeah. Take, the labs, our design lab is open on Saturday. It's not open all day Saturday, but it, three, four hours. Yeah, I think it's just in the afternoon from like one to five or, I don't know, right around, it's in the afternoon, it's not in the morning. Yeah, but it's a, it's a good block of time uh, where you can get a lot done, okay? Start looking at your personal lives, the time outside of class, okay? and really start to look where you can be spending every day on this, okay? An hour every day is going to add up by the time we get to December 15th. It really is, okay? Find an hour and work on this every day. Most of you, and this is just a guess, probably come to campus every single day, right? Or maybe, you know, four days out of five, okay? Can you come an hour early or stay an hour late? Can you come on an off day? Think about it. Look into your personal lives and find where you can work on this every single day. Because if you work on this every single day, it's, this is not impossible. But if you try to jam it all in after Thanksgiving, you're not going to turn in something that's really going to facilitate you know, a good portfolio piece. And I want this to be a good portfolio piece for you guys. Okay? Okay. If you're looking at your concept, and especially those that, that, that didn't turn in an animatic today, if you're looking at your concept and going, oh, shit, <laughs> there's no way I'm getting this done in time, right? This is your opportunity to simplify. Rein in the scope a little bit. So instead of doing you know, eight or nine shots, try to get it down to six or seven, right? Something that's a little bit more manageable, OK? Now is the time to do that. You don't want to do that on December 2nd, you know, when you really go, oh, there's no way I'm getting this done, right? Understand your personal lives, right, and how much time you have to commit to this, and use that as the driver of what you're trying to accomplish. Okay. One of the things that uh, I know you guys are going to want to use, and there's a lot of really great opportunity for this, especially with the animatics that were, were turned in today, is to continue to infuse a level of detail, a layer of detail into our animation with particles. The Moto particle system is amazing. I love the Moto particle system. Um, now, before we jump into it, I've given you guys a cool little project file that we're going to play with eventually. This was actually in last week's bundle of content, but because we talked about animatics for so long, we didn't really get a chance to, to dive in and, and dig into it. So it's this tree start zip file. Go ahead and open this up. We're going to get back to it here in a minute, but we're, that, this is going to be one of our, our kind of lab exercises. If you look at the project file, it's one of the default moto trees, right? But what doesn't it have on it if you're looking at it? Leaves, right? And we're going to put some leaves on this tree, okay? 
Let's jump into Modo and start looking at how we can use particles. So really, we're going to talk about two specific things today, particles and replicators. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, it's on D2L. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. I'm going to start off by, and I'm going to close all of, all of Cody's stuff. I'm going to start off by just playing around in an empty scene. Okay. And uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. Because today's conversation is all going to be is going to be about duplication and how we can use the particle engine inside of Modo to create some really compelling kind of duplicated items inside of our scene. This is the underpinning, the entire foundation of the Modo particle system. Particles can be used to do a lot of different things. I'm sure you guys have seen particle effects out there in the real world. Describe to me real fast, what in the world are particles? Yeah, like sparks in a video game. What else could be a particle effect? Dust, yeah. Liquid, mm, not so much liquid, but like smoke. Yeah, smoke. smoke. Fires are actually, if you look at the way computer graphics artists create fire, fire is actually a liquid. Okay, it's a real fancy fluid effect. Yep. Um, fog, maybe? Fog, maybe. Mm -hmm. Maybe, absolutely. Atmospheric stuff. Um, I watched Finding Dory last night with my crew, and which I love, by the way. It's such a fantastic film. And if you look at the underwater sequences, they have these kind of particulate kind of floating in the background and shimmering like a real you know, ocean would. Those are all particles, right? Particles don't necessarily have to be like sparks and rain and snow and you know, gunshot bullet fragments and stuff like that. Particles are really just a dot in space that we can assign a shape to. That's really all we're doing. And then we're using maybe our dynamics engine to make these particles move and dance and swirl around like a tornado or something like that, right? But really, they're just a dot in space. And then what's connected to the dot helps facilitate the illusion and the effect that we're trying to generate. The Modo, the Modo does a fantastic job of dealing with particles. However, let's start off with a very simple example that kind of illustrates what particles and replicators are all about. Because particles, they're just dots, right? They're just verts out there in our world. We have to connect them to a replicator to associate some geometry or a texture or some sort of volumetric effect to it to generate something we can render. Because as you know from your previous experiences working in 3D, vertices, they're not going to render, right? So we have to connect something to each one of those verts in order to see them show up in the final frame. All right, let's do it real fast. I'm going to start off in the model tab. And uh, I think initially, and uh, oh, this is Katrina's fault. Um, this is going to be fun, actually. Uh, this is going to be really fun. We're going to do two things. We're going to make a sphere, and then we're, this is Katrina as well, then we're going to make a donut. Because <laughs> I love me a donut, and Katrina got me in a donut mood. And specifically, we're going we're gonna to create some sprinkles that are going to go on top of this donut. So Katrina, take notes here, because this is something you can, should, and absolutely copy for your project file. Uh, <laughs> so let's start off with the sphere. Let's hold down the shift key, add a unit primitive to my scene. And there is my sphere. I'm going to change my viewport shading style back to default so we can see our sphere, right? Now, uh, luckily for us, inside of uh, you know, every default primitive shape, there are a whole bunch of verts on this object, right? The Moto particle system is just looking for vertices. It doesn't matter what those verts are, are attached to or if they're attached to anything. It's just looking for verts. How we create those verts, you know, well, there's a, main, there's, a, there's a multitude of ways that we can create particle geometry, point clouds, verts inside of Modo that will allow us to duplicate something on here. I'm going to take advantage of all the little verts on the sphere to act as a point cloud, a point source, if you will, for the replicator engine. All right, so here's my little sphere. Awesome. And I'm going to make it real big. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger than this. Actually, I'm going to make it gigantic, about 1,000% larger than what it originally was, 10 times larger. Excuse me, 100 times larger. And uh, now, let's start adding in uh, the, one of the basic building blocks of the Moto particle system, which is a replicator. A replicator is pretty fantastic. It's a way for the computer to duplicate very simple geometry a million times, okay? 
It's pretty magical. It's one of the reasons I love working inside of Modo as much as I do, because a replicator allows us to duplicate simple geometry, but in an organic fashion. And I think once you see it, you'll start understanding it. So let's go into the Add Item pull-down menu, and we're going to travel into the Particles section. And it's the first one on the list. We're going to get to some of those other categories here in a minute, but let's just initially create a replicator. There we go, and it shows up in our item list down here at the bottom. Note its icon, it's still a cube. We've seen this cube many times before, right? Where have we seen this cube icon before in the, in the modal library? What else gets assigned a little cube icon? A mesh, yeah, a mesh item gets a cube. An instance gets a cube. Yeah, instance, these are all pieces of geometry. Take some inspiration from that, right? Because what we are doing is duplicating geometry, OK? All right, so let's jump down into the properties of our replicator and look at where we need to go, OK? The lion's share of the editing that's going to be done on a replicator is going to begin inside this instancing category. And we need to do basically two things. We need to define what's going to serve as our point cloud, the, the, the item inside of our three-dimensional scene that's responsible for creating all these little dots. In our case, I want to use the sphere and all the verts on that sphere as the genesis of our, of, our, of our replicator system. So this is called the point source. The point source is the item that contains the particles, the dots, the verts, if you will. This could be a mesh item. It can be a surface particle generator. It can be a lot of different things, OK? But it needs to be an item that contains point data, verts. So I want to change my point source to sphere, OK? So we've defined, we've created a replicator. On that replicator, we've defined what the point source is going to be, which is where we're going to make you know, copies of all these little pieces. But we haven't yet defined what we're going to copy, right? And what we're going to have get generated across the entire, the entire sphere. So let me do this. I'm going to go back over into my basic tool area. And I'm going to add in just a unit primitive cube. Hold down the Shift key, click in a cube, OK? And I'm going to have this cube be replicated all over the surface of my little sphere, OK? If we return back to our replicator, in the instancing category of options in the replicator, the prototype is going to be set from none to cube. This is what we want to have duplicated across the sphere. Okay. Yeah, whoa, there it is. Now I have a sphere where there's cubes just like everywhere, right? Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, pretty neatio. Questions? Yes, sir? Mine are not going to my sphere. Mine are offset. Okay, so. If your are offset, it looks like you changed the location of either the prototype or the sphere in item mode. Okay, that's probably what's happening. Uh, so let's actually let me just keep going here for a second, and I think we'll get the answer to your question. Okay, so let's just check out what's happening here. If you look very very carefully, each one or on each vert on the sphere, the replicator has placed a cube. Awesome, right? Now, these are pretty special. The replicated geometry are kind of a special item inside of the, inside of the Moto library, inside of the Moto system, OK? Moto understands that a replicated item or a replicated piece of geometry like our square is not inherently going to move. So it makes it very light. It makes it very fast to render because the rendering engine is not trying to figure out the location of each one of those little cubes, right? All it's managing is the location of each one of the points on the sphere, right? So it makes it wicked fast, right? Wicked fast to render. We now can actually kind of generate entire forests of trees quickly, right? It's not having to track the item transform information for each individual cube. It's just looking at the raw geometry which makes replicated geometry render very, 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 very quickly, OK? The relationship between the replicator 
the point cloud and the prototype is pretty direct. Yes, sir? So you're just getting the, the bounding boxes of all your replicated items. Uh, so if you want to see them filled in like this, there's two things that you, you can and probably should need to look at. First and foremost, I have my replicator selected. Okay? Is yours selected? Now it's just gone orange. In addition, my viewport is being drawn using the default method. Is you got that on yours too? Okay, cool. So here's the change that you'll probably need to, to need to need to fix. If you open up your viewport properties under the drawing and control tab, replicators, mine is set to selected. What's yours set to? None. There you go. Right. And this is a good one to leave it at selected because if you look at the options, we can either have none, which is just going to create show the bounding box of the replicator, right? And the bounding box is just kind of the general volume that the, the prototype takes up inside of the scene. None is a, is a good one to have. Selected is a, another good one, because then it's only going to show uh, the, the shaded replicas when you have that replicator selected. Like, for example, if I grab my directional light, you can see what I get here. Two seconds, Cody, I see you. This last one's dangerous, OK? And it's all, OK? If you have multiple replicators inside of your scene, and if you're replicating like an entire forest of trees, oh, good God. this is going to really kind of bog down your GL experience in the viewport. I had a habit, leave it to none or to select it, just to make sure that it's only drawing the replicas when I want it to. OK, Cody, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to get that here in a second. We're going to come right back to that idea, because that, 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 that in line is one of the more powerful features of a replica uh, in the replicator system. However, let's, let's go back and, yeah, Tom, go ahead. The same problem. So did you open up your viewport properties? Yep. What is your replicator visibility setting set to? OK, so replicators are to select it. OK. OK. Okay, go ahead and cl click out of that window. Okay, do me a favor, click on camera. Now click back on replicator. Hmm, that's interesting. So the prototype's the cube. I don't know. I don't know. You could try. Here, before you go any further, make your sphere much, much bigger. That way you can kind of see much, much bigger. I made mine like a thousand percent bigger. Cool. Now let's try it again, see what happens. Okay. Cube, right? Point source is going to be this sphere. There it is. Cool. All right. Um, so it's doing it, but it's not drawing it. Click on your cube for a second, okay? And let's do this. Let's get out of the, the scale tool. Go ahead and drop your tool. And let's look at your viewport properties one more time. Let's change the replicator's visibility from selected to all. There we go. Okay. Ah, one, uh, yeah. So now we're, in addition, let's look at your active meshes here, the visibility of active meshes. This may be part of our problem. Let's go into inactive. OK, good. OK, so it is working. I'm not sure why I wasn't drawing it a minute ago, but at least it's working now. OK, let's keep cruising. All right, so let's get back to the relationship between the replicator and the, and the prototype. If you look very, very carefully, if you look very, very carefully to the location of the cube in reference to the surface of the sphere, what are you noticing? Look at the cube. Yeah. Clipping. It's clipping, right? We're only seeing about half the cube. Let's figure out why it's doing that, OK? I'm going to look at my scene from the front. And just to make life a little bit easier, I'm going to turn off the replicator and turn off the visibility of my sphere and zero in on the cube itself, okay? 
Now, I know it's a little bit difficult on what the projector is producing on the screen, but where is the cube in relationship to the origin of our scene? Yeah, it's centered at the origin, right? And specifically, it's centered uh, along the y-axis as well, OK? Replicators are going to take the prototype, and it's going to look at the center point of the prototype, OK? And the geometry's relationship and position to the, pro uh, to the center point of the prototype is going to determine where it's going to show up on the surface of, of our point. So if I go back to mine, turn on the sphere, OK? I want to have, I want to look like, I want it to look like that all my cubes are sitting on the surface of the sphere. So the easy fix here is to go back to the prototype, which in our case would be the cube, turn off the sphere and the replicator, and I want to move its location so that it's sitting on the middle of the y-axis, okay? And I'm going to do this in component mode. You don't want to do this in item mode, okay? If you do it in component mode, you're not going to mess up, you're not going to mess the, uh, um, the item points center point, which the replicator is pulling. And now, if I turn my sphere on, grab my replicator, yeah, now it looks like all the cubes are sitting on top, on top of the sphere itself, OK? So the, so the prototype's spatial relationship to its own center point is going to determine how it's going to show up on the particle itself. Gives us a level of customization here, OK? Now, one of the things that's really neat about this is, uh, is, is how the, replica the replicator manages all of this geometry. And this is why you want to work with replicators versus other duplication systems inside of, the, inside of Modo, right? Is that we can start offsetting these things. We can give it some twist, some scale offsets, even some, some position offsets to further make it look a little bit more organic. Like For example here, if we zoom back out and take a look at yeah, take a look at my cubes. Man, they're pretty much uniformly uh, you know, positioned. The, the size and scale of all of these cubes are identical to each other. So if I go in here into the variation section of my replicator, and let's do this. Um, let's just give it some random scale. I'm going to click on the zero to link all three of these. And we'll do like a 50% scale on all three axes. Now I'm going to have some big ones. I'm going to have some small ones. Okay. We can do some random twists in there too. Let's do random twists along the y-axis. Let's turn that, turn that off. There we go. Now it's randomizing the twists. Shoot, you can even randomize uh, the, the location of these things. Like this is kind of fun. Maybe I want to have some of my particles right on top of the surface of the sphere and others floating. Well, if I do a random offset along the y-axis, and I'm going to, oops. Because I'm all zoomed in, it, it flew off. Let's try that again. There we go. Yeah, now some are flying off of the surface, and some are staying on the surface and going into the interior of the sphere. This is why we want to work with replicators, because we can infuse an organic level of detail into a geometric you know, duplication system, which is kind of neat. Me likey the replicators. Okay. Questions on this so far? Yeah, good, kind of understanding it for the most part. All right, let's kick it up a notch. This is the basics of it. We create a replicator, an item that contains point information, and then a prototype that's going to represent the geometry we're going to place on top of each one of the points that the, the point cloud is generating. I'm going to go back in and uh, I'm going to get rid, uh, well, I'm not going to get rid of my cube, but I want to change the Let's turn off the replicator. I'm going to change how the replicator is generating some geometry for us, okay, or generating the points for us. I don't want to use all the points on my, on my sphere anymore. Because even though I you know, did a good job of randomizing it a little bit, if you look very carefully here, and let me deactivate the verts real fast. If you look very carefully, there's still kind of, you can see rows, right? You can see rows of, of geometry. You can see them going around here. It's still kind of uniform, right? What if I really want it to be random? Check this out. One of the things that we can create inside of Modo is a surface particle generator, which is going to randomly create a whole series of dots on a surface, right? In my case, I want those, those to be 
automatically generated and created for us uh, on the sphere. We go back into our add item pull down menu and once again return to our particles section. This point clouds area allows us to generate some items in here that will create particles, verts, points in space, kind of, you know, procedurally here in the computer, which is kind of nice. Shoot, we can even import point data from another application, like some, some really high-end particle systems will just point, pump out uh, a comma set. It's basically like an Excel spreadsheet of vertex locations. Um, RealFlow is a very popular, extraordinarily high-end simulation and particle, uh, particle generation system. Extraordinarily expensive, but this is what the big dogs use to do like oceans and like smoke and stuff. You can import in all their particles and then we can render them here, which is neat. Or we can have them create stuff, you know, internally for us. And specifically, we're going to do this surface particle generator. This is neat. Okay. I'm going to create a surface particle generator and then select it in the item list. There it is. With my surface particle generator selected, I now can tell it what surface to generate all these particles on. And in my case, I want my sphere to become populated with a whole bunch of dots. And I have a whole bunch of them, right? If you look very, very carefully, and it's impossible to see uh, in, in some situations, especially if you're zoomed out. But in, on the projector here, you can see a whole bunch of individual dots, right? Well, what's driving the distribution and the creation of all these dots? All of this stuff over here, OK? The first thing that we need to look at is the particle ceiling, which is down at the bottom of the generator category, OK? Right now, the computer has generated dun, 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 how many particles? 100,000 particles on my. Uh, <laughs> on my sphere, right? Let's just do it because I'm crazy. If I go back to my replicator, and I'm going to change my point source from sphere to what? Surface particle generator. This is going to break Moda, but let's just see what it does. Let me turn on my replicator. Now I have 100,000 cubes. And it completely slowed it down. There's 100,000 of these things on my cube. I may not see each cube. But they're there, right? Let's, uh, let's stop the bleeding. I'm going to change my point source to none just real fast. That way we can just keep going with the example. So when working with surface particle generators, you'll definitely want to start editing a lot of these properties. Okay? And there's a couple in here that we need to look at. We don't necessarily have to change the particle ceiling, because this is a ceiling. This is a maximum. Okay? What ultimately determines how many particles show up on the surface itself, believe it or not, is the average spacing value. This is the distance between each particle, right? By increasing the distance, the average distance between each particle, we're going to reduce the number of particles that are being distributed and created across the surface of our geometry. So I'm just going to. Let's see, let's put this at 12 inches. Yeah, and by increasing the average spacing to 12 inches, I've culled significantly the number of particles that are being generated across the surface of my sphere. Let's go wire this uh, surface particle generator back into my replicator and see what it looks like now. Yeah, I'm still getting a whole bunch. So this is just step one here. Let's put the average spacing to four feet. Yeah, there we go. Now it's a little bit more manageable, right? We're not, we're not getting as many particles. And now they're organically being drawn and created across the surface, the surface of my sphere. Some areas have big holes, others don't, right? The surface particle generator is pretty neato. It's just going to organically create particles across the entire, the entire object. Now, yeah. So uh, Isaac has just run into what I would think is a bug. I, have, I think this is honestly a bug inside of the particle system, where his particles are only being generated in a small quadrant, <laughs> a small quadrant inside of uh, the application. Now, Isaac, would you mind if I grab your computer just so folks can see this? Because you're going to run into this problem. You're very directly going to run into this problem. This, you're eight, right, Isaac? Yep. Let me snag it real fast. 
Yeah, let's take a look at Isaac's machine. Yeah, so if you, check, if you look at what Isaac's got on his machine here, they're only being generated in one small little area on the, uh, on the sphere itself. The problem is, and in my experience, it's probably a spacing problem. So right now, the average spacing is 100 millimeters. Let's put this at a meter. One meter. Yeah, and they spread out. Yeah. I have no explanation for that. It just kind of is what it is, as they say. Um, I'm sure if the developers down at the Foundry were listening to my live stream, they'd be able to very quickly tell me why it's doing that. But uh, it's just kind of strange, actually, the way that it does that. So if you're only getting particles in one small area of your geometry, start playing and kind of experimenting with that spacing value, the average spacing value. At some point, you'll hit critical mass, and everything will kind of, you know, kind of disperse pretty quickly across the entire surface. OK. Pretty neat, huh? Pretty cool. Now, we can further continue to refine how all of these surface particles are generated through some really, really great areas and some really great uh, um, additions to our modeling workflow. Okay? You guys are going to love and hate this, but vertex maps are going to come back with a vengeance. You guys love to hate the vertex maps, right? Well, the surface particle generator can tap in to the weight values that we assign to vertices inside of our scene. Let me show you what I'm talking about here. Maybe, just maybe, I only want to have surface particles created on you know, the top half of my, the top half of my, uh, um, of my sphere. Okay? I'm going to turn this off, the replicator off real fast, just so I can very easily create there we go, some selections. Do, 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 do. All right, so I'm going to hold down the shift key and the up arrow. Maybe I only want to have surface particles up there, right? If I go over into my lists tab and open up the weight map area, let's do this. Let's create a new map, OK? It's going to be a weight map. Let's give it an interesting name. Let's do, um, oh, what are we going to call it? Let's just call these um, particles patricles. Particles with an exclamation point just so we know it's ours, right? And I'm going to turn the initial value to 0, 0%, zero so off. Let's look at the vertex map. Okay, so there's the vert map that we currently are working with. And let me get my selection back. And I'm going to associate a weight using the weight tool to the polygons that I have selected, right? And uh, right now, the weight is at 100%. So I'll just click, and the top part goes red. So basically, any place that's red, a particle is going to be generated, right? That's the idea. Any place that has a weight value of 0%, no particles are going to be generated. Let's wire that into our, uh, into our surface particle generator and see how that affects our little crazy planet thing here. I don't know what this is. Okay. Okay. In the distribution section, check it out. Density vertex map. Right now it's set to none, but check it out. It's recognizing the weight map that I created. Bloop. And now it's only generating particles in the areas that I defined. Which is pretty neat. Which is very neat, by the way. Okay. So we can control where these particles are going to go. They're not just random. We can art direct it, as they say, right? We can absolutely determine where these particles are going through, through, the, through these weight maps, OK? OK. Um, let's do this. I'm going to put the density map back to none so that they're going all over the entire sphere again. And I want to reduce a lot of the randomness that I put in earlier, right? And I want to put the size modifiers back to zero. So they're all the same size now, OK? Randomly being created across the surface of my sphere. Now, another fun thing that we can do are these size maps, OK? Maybe, which is also a weight map. And I want to have, maybe I want to have the particles in the, like the equator line, <laughs> if you will, of my planet be one size, but then the particles at the top and at the bottom be a different size, right? Well, we, we can once again control the size of our particles with these weight maps, okay? 
Let's check it out. All right, let's create one. And this is going to live on the sphere itself. I'll create a new way, a new map, and I'll call these size control. All right, and let's look at the at the uh, um, sphere itself. Okay, so maybe I want to have all of these polygons, and let's look at the the vertex map itself. These are going to have a value of 100%. Okay, and then hmm, how am I going to do this? Let's have a transition to a value of 0% at the poles. Okay, so they're going to shrink. There we go. And uh, let's like, yeah, let's do this. Let's do a fall off, a linear fall off, and I'll have it begin right here at the origin. And one of the things that we can change here instead of our fall offs is that we can assign a symmetrical uh, role to our fall off. So now, in every sense, I'm assigning weight values symmetrically along uh, the the y-axis here. And uh, yep, I think we're good to go. So I'll just do Shift W to fire off the weight tool. Yeah, and let's do this. Let's put it down. Let's see, is it doing the distribution? Let's see. Oops, I overshot it. Actually, this needs to be at 100%. I haven't done a single thing. There we go. Looks like my, my spacing is a little bit off, but that's okay. This will just be proof of concept. So now we have a nice gradient of values coming from the center all the way to the top. You know what might be better? Let's just do this. Yeah, I'm just make sure the, the start point of my fall off is where I want it to be. Let's just do this. Let's, um, let's just go back to our uh, vertex map shading style. And let's just do that. Let's do 100%. Why is it not doing what I thought it should be doing? Ah, because I was doing it backwards. Whoops. There we go. Let's see what that generates for us. I'm curious now. This, uh, this may not work, but let's have fun with it. So we're going to use that vertex map that we just created to influence the size of our particles. And here's the new one called size control. Let's turn on our replicator and see how it looks, which is pretty cool. Oh, no. <laughs> I accidentally loaded the advanced viewport, which wasn't what I wanted. It completely bogs down our machines. There we go. Ah, look at that. So now I'm controlling the size of it. And there's a nice, subtle gradient. It's, it's not as subtle as I wanted it to be. But we are, in fact, controlling the, the weight of each one of those, or excuse me, the size of each one of those particles by the weight map on the sphere itself. So these surface particle generators give us a tremendous amount of control, right? We can now place these particles where we want them to be. Let's kick it up a notch, OK? Because these surface particle generators are, uh, are pretty neat. What if? What if, and I've just had a brain dump here. Um, what if I want to be able to control the distribution and creation of my surface particles with the texture, right? That's a cool idea, right? Maybe I, I've UV mapped my sphere, and I just want to have like a, oh, can I do this? Let's see. Do I have the assets to do this in front of me? I don't. I have an idea. This is going to be crazy. This is crazy pat time. I think in Photoshop, and please let this be in Photoshop. Please let this be in Photoshop. Crazy Dave, you can still call me Crazy Dave if you'd like. Oh, OK. I think I've played Plants vs. Zombie like exactly one time. So I'm, I'm not exactly the expert in Plants vs. Zombie world. But let's do this. Let's do a custom shape. Let's do um, let's do all. Show me all the symbols in Photoshop, and let's make them pretty big so we can see what's going on. Because I think there's a gigantic. Let's have some. Let's have some fun here. Um, where are we going to create particles? 
Well, the lightning bolt's a good one. The foot is a contender, too. That one's just kind of stupid and silly. Boring shapes, boring shapes, boring shapes, boring shapes. Um, let's see here. I was hoping for like a thumbs up. But the lightning bolt has won. Let's do the lightning bolt. Or the foot. No, let's do the foot. The foot offends you? OK, I'll do lightning bolt then. You're welcome. Um, or do we want to do the fire? No, we'll do the foot. We'll do the lightning bolt. OK. All right. I know, I'm, I'm a model of indecision at times. All right, oops, I wanted that to make a shape. I want it to be a shape. There we go. Then lightning bolt. Cool, right? Oh, it's not. I wanted that to be white instead of black. Aha, lightning bolt. OK, so let's save this out. Save, file save. And we're going we're gonna to use this as a texture on top of my, on top of my sphere. Lightning bolt. Let's save it as a PNG so we don't have to manage all the layers. Good. All right. I'll bring that back over here into Modo, and I'll just place that on my sphere. Turn off my replicators real fast so I can see what I'm doing. This is better work. I've, if I, have I hyped it uh, effectively, appropriately? Maybe. Maybe. Maybe possibly. I'm OK with that. I'm good with some hype. Whoa, it's a little big. Let's do this. Um, now I'm being an artist, which is, looks like syndrome. You just made my day. Syndrome. I'm freaking out over here, right? Syndrome is like my favorite. Number two, yeah, yeah. They're making, an, they're finally making a second Incredibles. You'd think, out of all the Disney or Pixar franchises, we would have had three Incredible films right now, right? <laughs> With our addiction to trilogies and superhero movies, we would have at least three Incredible films, right? Nope. <laughs> all right. Anyways, I'm not bitter. Maybe I am a little bit bitter. Yeah, they are making Toy Story 4. Yeah. Uh, you know, I saw that the other day. They, they, are, they are changing things up. All right, so there's my lightning bolt. Woohoo! Cool. All right, hang out. Bear with me here, all right? Now, what I can do is, I believe, let's see, yeah. I can change the effect. Let's do surface particle, surface generator density. And that's not doing a single thing. Uh, I'm missing something. I apologize. They have changed something. Uh, oh, that's right. No, wait a minute. Hold on a second. I think I'm confusing myself here. Where I'm going with this, though, is that you can have a texture modulate the distribution and creation of a, of a, of a particle, um, which is pretty cool. I think I have, maybe, gen maybe density is the wrong one. Maybe it's just size. Oh, there we go. Da -da -da. I had it. I just didn't change. So here's how you do it. And this is my brain dump happening on a Friday afternoon. See, I should, I should know better to drive heavy machinery on a Friday afternoon. Um, you have to create a surface generator in your shader tree, right? Which can be found under the processing, nope, under the special section of your shader tree. And that's going to only create particles that are inside of that material group, right? And then we can use a texture. And this effect, which can be found under circuit surface particle generation, perhaps we change it to density, yeah. And it's only creating, here, let's do this. I'm, I'm, I've set my repeat, my horizontal and vertical wrap to uh, reset, which is only stamping down my, um, my lightning bolt just once. Let's put this at two meters. Oops, that's, let's try one meter. Nope. 500 millimeters, 
Still going 100 millimeters. There we go. Okay. So if I was to go back to my texture, okay, and put its texture locator to repeat and repeat. Yeah, there it is. Now I'm only generating particles in the lightning bolts as they get repeated over and over and over again on, on the image itself, which is very, very cool, by the way. Yeah, it's pretty rad, right? I know I don't have to tell you, but I feel compelled to tell you, right? It's pretty great. It's insane, right? The technology in here is pretty amazing. It's very, very cool. I dig it. I do like some good particle generation. Cool, huh? You, technically, you can. There is a liquid dynamic solver, but it's not ready for prime time yet. Yeah, it's there. Um, I hope that the developers of the Foundry are continuing to refine and and uh, enhance the liquid solver. It's it's just not real great. Yeah. Ten point two is out. There's a lot of good stuff in there. Check it out. Um, there's a really great feature that I that I use that I have used that's worth its weight in gold called automatic retopology, where you can take like a, a mesh that you get from ZBrush or maybe a mesh fusion mesh or like some, a mesh with, from scan data, then automatically retopologize it down into quads of a certain polygonal weight, which is awesome. Um, I don't remember what I mentioned earlier, but I go onto the, the Foundry's website and they'll, they'll give you a list of all the things that's in 10.2. All right, so. Why is this important, right? Uh, well, we've kind of gone over how easy it is to to uh, um, to create you know some pretty amazing you know big chunks of data. One of the other really great things that since we're now working and participating inside of this particle system is that we can tap into a new way to shade and create all of these little particles, right? And this one's going out to Katrina because we're going to make us a donut, <laughs> right? It's donut time, man. I'm hungry. You guys ready for a donut? Me ready for a donut. All right, well, let's do this real fast. This is going to be a fun, simple little example. All donuts or all examples need to begin and end with a donut, right? Mmm, donuts. Okay. Me like you the donuts. Okay, I am curious. Do we have a UV map for this? We do have a UV map for this. It does make it a whole lot easier. Let's see how the UVs are created here. All right. Okie dokie here. This is going out to Katrina. All right. Um, let's see. How are we going to do this? Oh, I have some ideas. Um, we should make it pink. And I was just sitting here. I was like, hmm, how can I make it pink? All right, I got it. I'm on it. Let's do this. We're actually going to do a couple different things here. And if you're used to working inside of Moto, it really kind of showcases why having all these tools integrated is such a powerful, powerful feature. Because I'm going to create a custom texture here. I want to paint a custom texture for my donuts that I'm going to then displace and use as the source for my particle density map. Okay, So we're going to reuse and recycle some stuff here. Let's jump into the paint layout. Let's jump into the paint layout. There we go. Let me turn off the grid here. And let's start making some stuff. This is going to be my don't. Oops, there are no polygons to operate on. What? I hit the N key instead of the M for material key. This is going to be our donut. Awesome. Now, inside that shader, inside the material, I got it selected. So let's start adding and painting a texture map. Some of you guys have seen me do this before, but it's really neat. So I'll showcase it again. We can actually paint custom texture maps inside of Moto. It's really easy to do it. You have to have a UV map, which is why I was looking at the UVs in my donut a minute ago. But, uh, and we have to isolate this entire shape into its own little material. Okay. Oops, let me go back in time. There we go. All right. So with my material group selected, I can travel over into the utilities area. And I'm going to add a color texture. Okay. Let's just call this donut frosting. We go. I'm gonna put it right on my desktop. I do love a good PNG, so I'll make it a PNG. 
Uh, the resolution is going to be 2K RGBA, that's just fine. And uh, the color space is set to default, which is also, we'll set it to R sRGB so it looks correct. All right, so now I have an empty image over here that's affecting my diffuse color value. And if I return to my paint tools now, let's just get a nice soft airbrush. Let's pick an appropriate Pepno Bismo green. So I'm doing like the Simpsons, do the Simpsons donut. Mmm, donut. Huh? Pepno, it, well, kind of. <laughs> Let me just see if I'm on the right color. Yeah. All right, so now I get to paint a little donuty edge here. My, my brush is just too soft. I'll just change temporarily to a hard brush. Yeah, that way I can work a little bit faster. That's very true. Yeah, being able to interactively paint your textures inside of Modo is pretty great. All right, there we go. That's good enough for the outline. There is a fill tool, but I think there, if you look over in your toolbar, and I just messed up, and I'm yes, I'm being a dork here. Go, so you erase some of that. There we go. That's good enough. Let's see if the fill works. I'm not sure if the fill is going to work in this particular situation. And it did. It got me pretty close. And then I'll just clean up the edges here. So pink donut. And the reason I did this with the texture, because I wanted that nice little soft curve in between all this. But then I can re also recycle this texture to serve as my particle density map. We just went over that a second ago, right? Now I really do want a donut. It is. I'm going for the Homer Simpson donut here. Nope. This is just, it is. It is reflecting. Okay, done. I'm happy with that. That's a good little donut, right? And then maybe the base material will be a lovely shade of donut-y brown. Okay. Let's see. If I jump into the render environment, is that showing up there? No. Why am I not getting... Probably needs to be that one that needs to be spent or set to a nice little velvety brown. There we go. Mmm, donut. Mm. Oh man, let me tell you. Whoever whoever invented the donut hole should get some sort of like American medal of like freedom or something, whatever they give out, right? Because that single handedly got me through college. You know? <laughs> All right, so here we go. So here's my donut. It's looking pretty good, actually. I'm pretty jazzed about this. Uh, I'm liking the direction that this is going in. Here, let me, uh, since I like this, I'm going to do save all. And uh, let's just put it on my desktop. Pats, yum, yum, donut. OK, cool. And oh, didn't I just save all? Save, oh, I, uh, yep, don't need that one. Oops. This is supposed to be Pat's Yum Yum Donut. What? Sprinkles? How did you know that's where I was going? Yeah. You're a smart guy. That's where you knew how we're going. OK, so this is looking pretty good. Me likey. So now what we need to do in here is go and create some particles, right? And that surface generator inside of our, inside of our shader tree is going to do a lot of the lifting for us, the heavy lifting for us, OK? However, we need to sprinkle, right? First things first, we've got to have a prototype for our sprinkle. And uh, what shape is a sprinkle? It is a capsule. There we go. And let me see. I remember how to make a capsule. I so very rarely make a capsule. There we go. I did it, right? They actually have a capsule uh, generator. Something that's good enough. It's kind of gigantic at the moment, so I'm going to center it. And I want to make it very small. And then it actually also needs to be 
on its own mesh item too. So let's cut and paste this from one mesh item into another. And let's start getting specific here, okay? So these are gonna be my sprinkle, sprinkle prototype. This is my donuts. Donuts, and this is not being used at the moment, so I'll get rid of it. All right. It's still a little too big. It's okay. It'll be all right. It'll be okay. But I do need to put it in its own material. Uh, Travis, can you do this? I just want to meet you. And your, your live stream is on the home page. That's how I do it. I don't, no, like on the home page of, uh, yeah, that's right, because I'm awesome. Are you currently logged in? No, no. Wait, so I'm a recommended video on the front page of YouTube right now? Take a look. It's right here on the screen. Because well, YouTube knows how awesome I am. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty proud of that, actually, yeah. right? They, know what we like. they do know. YouTube instinctively knows who is awesome, yeah. right? And yes, it is me. No, 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 no. No, no, the algorithm is simple. It says... Yeah, no, the algorithm says Pat is awesome. Let's put him on the front page. Okay, enough of that. Let's keep going because uh, we're running out of time. Although that is fun and very entertaining. Uh, <laughs> so here's what we're going to do. We're going to, now that we have a sprinkle and a place to put the sprinkles, let's go ahead and make the particle generator itself. Okay, so let's go add layer, special, surface generator. Awesome. Now, nothing's, this is just generating the particles. We haven't told it where to generate the particles. That's where this image map is going to come into play, right? Uh, let's duplicate this. And I'm actually going to create an instance of it. So I'm using less RAM here. Let's change the effect to uh, surface generator density. Okay. Now, it's kind of impossible at the moment to visualize how all this is working together. So let's add our replicator into the mix and start hooking all this stuff up. So the prototype is going to be the sprinkle. The point source is going to be the surface generator, and it's not working. Well, it's kind of working, but the sprinklers are not going where I want them to go, right? I only want them to show up on the pink. So let's return to our shader tree and see why that is not working, OK? Yeah, OK, let's see what's going on here. Um, I don't want to use these. Maybe I'm using the wrong effect. Let's go back into the normal. Nope. Although that is cool. Size. Yeah, it's just going to make small ones. You know what? I think I have the. I see what the problem is. I think I need to invert my map. Let's go. Let's invert it. Nope. That's not having a big enough effect. Um, hmm. I wonder if it's only allowing. See. I wonder if it's. Let's ignore the alpha channel. Oop. Ignore the alpha channel. There we go. That's what I was at. It was the alpha channel that was causing the problem on that, right? Um, when I hit ignore alpha channel, it ignored all the transparency information that was, that was written on the actual file itself. And now I'm only generating my little cool sprinkles where I have the pink, the pink, uh, pink frosting kind of doubled up, which is very entertaining. Uh, they're a little uniform though, right? We don't actually need the prototype. And this is where the replicator really comes in into play here. Because I can very, very easily start adding a little bit of a twist in here. Maybe let's add a lot of a twist. And now it's randomizing the location of all these sprinkles, okay? Or randomizing the, the rotation of it. Let's give it a little bit of an offset too. Maybe we can push some of them away from each other. Yeah, now they're not clipping into each other as much. A couple of random sprinkles down below. That's not the end of the world, OK? And this is starting to look pretty cool. I'm very pleased with this. Now, I'm going to intentionally keep all the sprinkles kind of big. Uh, that way, they're a little bit easier to see. But you know, it, what would be really neat, and I mean really neat here, if, uh, if all the sprinkles were kind of not white, right? Uh -huh. Maybe there were a variety of different colors, because whenever I go get donuts, I love the sprinkle donuts, by the way, right? Those are like my two favorite donuts are the, anything with sprinkles on them, because that's awesome, right? And anything with like the Boston cream on the inside, that's what I'm talking about, right? Chocolate Boston cream donuts, yeah. Megan's shaking her head like, are you crazy? Aren't you from Boston, Megan? You should like, no, okay. 
And that's the, probably all they can talk about, right? Because it is the best thing on the face of the planet. Yeah. Custard? I'm not, you know, here and there. OK. So let's go into our, our sprinkle, OK? Because if you look very carefully, I created a material group called sprinkle. And on the inside, this material right here is what's ultimately driving the color of all my sprinkles. Let me prove it to you. If I change the color to blue, all my replicated elements go to blue. That's nice. Yeah. Uh, OK. It looks, it looks different. It looks different. All right. I want each sprinkle to be assigned a random color value. Since we're working inside the particle world now, we get to access each particle's unique particle identification number. Okay? What you're not seeing in the front end of Modo is that every time Modo creates a particle, it makes them unique from one another by giving each particle its own number. right? And it's randomly, randomly assigning these numbers. And no two particles can have the same number. Well, if we tap into that, I can then assign a random color value to each particle, right? It's pretty neat. Let's go ahead and do it real fast. The process that we, that we have to create this system involves creating a gradient. Because a gradient will allow us to capture all the colors that we want the computer to assign to my sprinkles. You can create gradients under the Add Layer pull-down menu. And they're under Processing. And there it is, Gradient. Okay. OK, rock and roll. This is kind of what I want. I want it to affect the diffuse color. However, oops, I clicked off of it. Let's jump in. Let's go in and begin to define the colors of all of our sprinkles. Now, I'll have some white ones, because there are some white sprinkles. Uh, if I click on the middle mouse button, this is a gradient editor, by the way. If you use the middle mouse button and click in this bar, you'll add a keyframe. Each keyframe is going to define a color of a potential color of one of your sprinkles. And I want this keyframe, I'll click here to open up my color picker. I want it to be, oh, I don't know, some of them like a light blue, right? That's cool. Let's add a couple more. I think there's some dark red ones in there too. Okay. This is for Isaac since he liked the blue ones. Okay. I'll make a blue one. Okay. Or darker blue. There we go. And you want a black sprinkle? I'll, make, I'll give you a black sprinkle. Why not? Okay. Oh, for Although that is very cool. Look at the effect that it's getting. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool, right? That's and I'll tell you why it's doing that here in a second. But that even even that right there is pretty neatio. <laughs> All right. Um, and then I think they have some like yellow sprinkles in there too. I don't know why I'm spending this much time figuring out the exact color science of sprinkles. But you know, there are worst ways to spend my Friday afternoons. All right. Uh, I'm going to make one small change to my, to my color values. And if I select all the keyframes, I'm going to change their curve interpolation to stepped. That way, the computer is just going to assign that value and not the transition color between those values, right? Now, gradients take an input, right? That's why if you look at, the, uh, at, my, at one of my sprinkles, it looks like it's got that colored banding. It's showing up that colored banding because of this incidence input parameter, right? The incident angle is the angles kind of around the edges, the, the part of the model that's not facing the camera itself, OK? Because you get the glancing angle, which is when the, the ray fires out from the, from the camera and strikes a plane that's perfectly parallel to it. That's called the glancing angle, right? The incident angle is a plane that's perpendicular to it, you know, the outsides, the, the edges, if you will. Well, we don't want to assign these color values to the incident angle of our little sprinkles, right? We want to go under uh, particle effects. We want to access the particle identification numbers, OK? And use the particle IDs to assign a color. And there we go. Random sprinkling of. Oh, the sprinkles are clipping. To, yeah. Many of the sprinkles are clipping, but that's okay, right? Okay. That's okay. Unfortunately, we don't have any technology at the moment to stop that interpenetration at the particle level. Really? Yeah. Uh -huh. Not with this technology. We okay. do in other places. Okay. You can actually have par uh, particles be a member of a dynamic rigid body system, and then they'll then they'll you know bounce off each other and, and so on and so forth. Cool, huh? 
Donuts. I like donuts. Donuts are pretty fantastic, right? Right? Yeah. All right, see you later. Have a good weekend. Um, all right, questions on this? Pretty neat, huh? Pretty neat. Pretty neat. All right, this will be the last thing, and then we'll kind of escape for the afternoon. Let's play with that tree for a second, okay? I want to save my project file because this is too yummy not to keep. All right. So if you look at the tree that I gave you, let's figure out the system that we're going to have to employ to put the leaves on the tree because this is the big challenge here, right? If you go over, there we go. It is leafless, okay? Leafless, excuse me. And we need to put leaves all over the tree. Now, logically, where should all the leaves show up? On the branches, right? So we don't want to, so in order to put the leaves on the tree, what do we need to generate? Well, we need to generate some particles, right? And we need to control those particles or control the creation location of all of those particles, right? How could we do that? First, we need a replicator, right? So, and we also need a leaf. Here's a cool thing. If you go into your layout tab, your layout layout at the top of the screen, and um, uh, oh, it's no longer here. It, you, there used to be an images section in here. Um, they must have taken it away. So here's what we'll do, because it's not ever going to show up in here. Uh, let's, if you hit the F6 key on your keyboard, you're going to open up your preset browser. And specifically, where we're going is into this images folder. Okay? This, is what all, this is what your asset directory looks like for all of the Moto presets. If we go into images, there happens to be, where is it? I can't remember where it lives. Is it under organic? It may be under organic. Here we go, leaves. Dun, 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 dun. So, images, organic, leaves. All right? And now, let's put a leaf on the tree. Okay? Now, there's two things in here. There's two things in here that we're going to need. We're going to need both the leaf and what's called a stencil. This is going to cut. This is going to cut the leaf out. Okay. All right. You know, I think somewhere there's actually some. Oh, you know what? No, I'm sorry. Stop. Rudder midships. In I just remembered this. They already have leaves made in the preset library that has all. It's right there. The leaves. <laughs> A gigantic fold. So that's my problem. I'm sorry. So go back into your layout browser. Okay. In the layout layout and into your meshes browser, and I'm under uh, meshes, and then where was that? Organic leaves. Because this, this is going to create a polygon and automatically place all of the images and its stencil map on the polygon for you. OK? OK, so I want to pick this lovely red leaf, leaf 01. If you double click on it, it'll get added to the scene, but it's so small that it's inside the tree. OK? So there's our prototype. And now we need a replicator. OK, so let's add that replicator in, particle replicator. Let's start plugging it in. The prototype, of course, is going to be the leaf. Now, the point source, we haven't. We haven't determined and generated a point source yet, right? Let's go create one. Let's just create a surface particle generator. It's in the same area, particles, point clouds, surface particle generator, right? This is going to create the particles for us. And then on that surface particle generator, we, ne we need to tell it which model to create the particles on, which is going to be tree, no leaves, 04. OK? Now, it's all over. If you look very carefully, you'll see it on your screen, and you can just barely see it on mine. If you've done it correctly, you should see a whole bunch of orange dots all over your tree. It's a mess, it's a mess right? And we, don't want, and we don't want particles on like the trunk, right? We only want the particles to be, to be generated on the branches themselves. Well, check this out. Maybe we can go in, and I've forgotten if this has already been created for you. It might actually be. Go into your, uh, select your tree, 
then go into your lists tab. Yeah. Let's see, do they have one for us? We may have to make one for, it looks like we may have to make one, which is fine. So we're gonna create a new weight map, okay? Let's create a new weight map. Let's call these uh, branches. Okay, and on that weight map, I'm just going to very quickly, and I mean very quickly, just using my polygonal selection set, grab the polygons where I want to have the leaves show up. Okay. And I'm going to do this just pretty quickly because I know we're running out of time, and I, for that I apologize. So maybe I want to have all the leaves show up in here. You could get very specific with this, but as a proof of concept, that's going to work, right? You grab the polygons, you fire off the weight tool, which can be found under the vertex uh, map pull-down menu. And then if you sign a value of 100%, there you go. It's something like that. So wherever it's red, right, wherever we've assigned a vertex weight of 100%, particles will be generated. Okay? Everybody with me? Yeah? Alex has it. He's done it. Right? He's three steps ahead, as always, which is good. Since we now have this weight map, we can return to our surface particle generator and access that weight map under the distribution section. Okay. Branches. Okay. Return to our default mode. It's going to be pretty hard to see because of the texture that's on there. We now can link in on the replicator the surface particle generator as, it, as its point source. Mission accomplished. Yeah, they're actually, a, well, I don't know, correctly may not be the right word, but they're actually attached. Yeah, they're attached correctly. Pretty cool, huh? This is how you do leaves on trees, right? You don't, you're not going to model every leaf, right? That's just, you're not going to do that, right? If you have done that, I'm sorry, right? You, you, you monument, monumentally wasted your time if you did that, right? We want to kind of procedurally generate particles and then assign a leaf to be placed on each one of those particles. Using a surface particle generator or just a surface generator in the shader tree, we can definitely determine how many particles and where those particles are going to be created across either the, in, across a surface, like we're doing with the surface particle generator, or across the contents of a material group, as we're doing as we're doing with the surface generator. Okay. If you've ever looked at the high-end visual effects that you see coming out of Hollywood and wondered how they do, like environments or you know, really high detailed environments that contain like a lot of dirt or like bricks and rubble and stuff. People aren't modeling that individually, right? They're using particles, right? And then placing geometry at those particle locations. Coolio, huh? Yeah. Pretty, pretty neat. For many of you, this is something that you can and can, should continue to use for your final project in this class, right? If you, uh, last time we did this, someone made an entire city using replicators, right? They blasted out some particles, they created a couple basic buildings, and then they replicated those buildings to create some city streets. It's Is pretty cool. Is Grand Theft Auto V does? Maybe. You know, Grand Theft Auto V has some pretty intense technology. Mm -hmm. You know, they have $286 million worth of technology in that game. So it's, it's really difficult for me to say from an outside perspective yeah. specifically what they're doing. Yeah. But probably. <laughs> probably. No, seriously, probably. Yeah. This is kind of a universal idea that's, you know, that you see all over the place, right? Um, yeah, because people, you don't want to go in and hand place each leaf on the tree. It takes, it takes way too long. All right. Um, over the next seven days, or actually the next two weeks, I'm not going to see you guys, right? Uh, if you have, uh, have an animatic in tow, you need to start plotting out specifically what your rough animation is going to be like, okay? The goal between now and the next time I see us, I see you guys, is to have a rough pass of your animation done. Strive to do an entire pass. It's okay if things are still blocky. Animation is an art form of many passes, okay? I know this. You know this, okay? 
Do the work in passes. I know it's going to feel uncomfortable. You're going to naturally want to try to do final finished work the first time, okay? But trust me, it's a lot easier. It will eventually go faster if we plot out the key frames in each one of our shots before we try to up res it and do all the in betweens as well, okay? Sound good? Have a wonderful, wonderful holiday next week. Please go vote, and we'll see you guys in a couple weeks.